Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Uriel Eisen, uh, coming on as a repeat visitor. Uh, Uriel is the owner of Austere Manufacturing, um, and he's done a bunch of other really cool stuff. But right now, he's working on just the coolest buckles for bike packing in the adventure sports industry. They've been featured in the Radivist and also Bike Packing Magazine. Uh, Uriel, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Good to have you back. Yeah, no, I, I always enjoy these conversations, and uh, yeah, this time I'm kind of excited to get more into what you're doing at Astir. So yeah, it should be fun. Yeah, so I forget exactly where we were on the last last episode, but, but it's, it's been quite a while, so <laughs> I think it's a good good amount of there. Yeah, I, I mean, there might be some repeat stuff, but I, I feel like the way that you do things, you're advancing so quickly that like it's going to be a different take on it, even if it is. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, which is a little different than what we usually talk about since we're pretty technical minded folks is you're really good at media. So before you did Austere, you've been in Wired. I think I, I know you've been in the Times, but you reminded me you've been there twice, which is crazy. The New York Times for those listening, um, Forbes 30 under 30 and obviously the Radivist and Bikepacking Magazine. How do you do that? How do you get these attention of those uh, publications? Um, yeah, uh, it's a good question. I, I guess I don't know exactly how to answer it. My, my, I think it's about the approach and just thinking through, um, thinking through like who is your customer, kind of in a funny way. Like, um, yeah, so that's kind of it. I, I, and to, I guess get into that a bit more. Um, like when you're approaching a a journalist or, a, or some publication, I think it's important to just think through, like, what is their issue? Like, what is their problem that they're trying to solve? Like, there's a person behind the desk at the other end of your email, and they have a job, and they have a boss, and they have uh, deadlines and stresses and, like, a whole life. And I think if you think about what their pain points are as if they are a customer, right? Like sort of customer centered design. If you think about like, what are their pain points and what is the publication sort of trying to present itself as? And then you kind of like dig into that. I, I think it gives you a, like that. that's how I do it. I mean. That's interesting. So, yeah, so I, I think just like, for example, if you have a, like if you approach someone and say, like, do you want to write an article about me? Um, if you sent that email to me, I mean, I'm not a journalist, but <laughs> for whatever reason you did that email. Well, so you got some insights, I, though. <laughs> I think like one of my first thoughts would just be like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. Like, I don't want to do work. <laughs> um, right. But yeah. if, on the other hand, you sent me an email that was sort of like, hey, I'm doing this project. I see you've covered this topic before. And we're approaching it a little differently in that we're doing these things. And so it has this interesting effect. Are you interested in this? I feel like you're sort of telling them what that article is, right? Yeah. Like they don't have to sit there and go like, okay, who is this person? Like how, what angle am I going to take? Does that fit with my publication's sort of uh, viewpoint or whatever? Like sort of like that. And so the funny thing is, I, I don't feel like it's much different than sales to anyone. So it's almost right? like, like uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, sa like sales and media, I feel like it's the same thing because essentially you're asking someone, you're trying to present something in, in such a way that, that the other person goes like, hey, I'll give you my money or hey, I'll give you my time. And, and so like in that way, I just feel like it's, it's very similar and it's really just key to understand like, what is the whole experience of your customer? So, yeah, if it's a, I like if it's a, if it's a, someone you're trying to sell a product to, and your website is a real pain in the ass, like that matters, right? Like you might, <laughs> you probably are losing sales because of that. And in a similar way, if you approach a journalist and you're sort of putting it on them to figure out what the story is. I think the bar for your story is much higher suddenly, right? Like now you have to have a really obvious story or a really, really compelling story. 
but you might not need to have that if you can figure out like, okay, for example, I don't know, you know, I was in Pittsburgh years ago, but, uh, you know, Pittsburgh is trying to paint itself as a tech hub, as like a innovative hub, right? So I think like any story that's showing like, oh, look, we're like leveraging this cool community and it's such a good community. Like any, any story like that is instantly going to be easier to get someone to bite and get, get people behind it. Um, the other really easy cheat I've found is just like, if you say really positive, flattering things about people, they're very likely to share that. Right? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. That's cool. Um, when, when do you typically kind of come up with this stuff? Are you just trying to like, when you start your day, is it sort of at the end of the day, do you make time once a week? Cause I feel like at least for me, sort of finding time to strategize about the business is kind of a back and forth and it'd be interesting to hear your approach to that. Yeah. I, I don't think I have a very like structured approach to any of this. Um, okay. perhaps to my detriment, <laughs> um, <laughs> like it's something I've been thinking about more is like, I need to set aside a certain amount of time, for example, for sales every day. Um, right now what's been happening, I mean, just to like, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know that I'd super advertise this, but, um, I, I think currently when, when I have tons of sales in the funnel, I'm like, oh shit, I need to manufacture a lot of buckles <laughs> and then my sales efforts drop off. But of course there's a lagging effect from my sales 100%. efforts. To, and so then I like get through that peak. And then I sort of hit this valley where I'm like, oh no, like I don't have, you know, I really need more sales. So then I hit sales hard. It <laughs> happened with so SK a, all the time. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of a vicious cycle. So that's something mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about is like smoothing out. And the nice, the nice side of that is it's very nice to know that you have a good sales process that does drive like that, that it's an effective funnel. Um, right. Like if your sales efforts directly drive dollars in, that's great, uh, but just uh, managing that load and making sure you have an even or a fairly flat um, demand on production, I think makes a lot of things easier. So uh, yeah, sales, marketing, all that stuff, I don't think it's, it, I don't have time set aside for it. Um, what I do have are uh, lists of things that are very quick for me. So. Like if there's someone I want to reach out to, or there's someone who I think has a, um, you know, who, who my, my story fits with what they're putting out. Um, I'll just make a note of that somewhere and then kind of revisit it and just kind of keep an eye on them. That's great. Um, yeah. I mean another, okay. So, I mean, this is maybe a little more specific, but, um, like one thing I've found on social media and a lot of people, you know, it's sort of like, uh, influencer marketing is dead it's not really but you know it, there was a big boom and now it's everything the market has kind of um normalized i would say in terms of like people charge for the time people charge for exposure all that um but sometimes when i find a really big account i that i want to engage with you know if they have like a million followers the odds of them paying attention to a direct message are pretty low um, and I think you could apply this to anyone, right? It's not just social media. If you're tra trying to bag a reporter at a big newspaper, they have a lot of inbound. Yeah. Well, and, and I've had and people so, show me some of the messages they reject from those sorts of outlets. And I mean, they yeah. take a disdainful look at these people reaching out <laughs> cold a lot of the time. Right. And so I haven't had great luck reaching, direct, reaching out directly to really, really big uh, people. Uh, big in terms of, you know... <laughs> You're Assumed to a lot of inbound noise. traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And so what I'll often do on Instagram, and there's ways of doing this on other platforms or just, you know, around a newspaper or whatever, is trying to figure out who their network is and who they look to as like influential or um, something like that. So, for example, on Instagram, you can look at who someone follows, right? And then you try to find some of their followers who have around 10,000 followers. And those people have enough clout in terms of the weird world of social media with 10,000 <laughs> followers, right? Like you have enough clout, but at the same time, 
um, they don't have as much inbound traffic. And so I've found 10,000 to be a pretty good number at the moment for people who are fairly responsive, um, and, but also influential enough for that to make a difference. And so if you find like five or 10 other people around that person you're trying to uh, engage with, um, and you can get some stuff going with them, whatever, you know, uh, and they follow you or whatever, or you send them some samples and they post about it. Um, and these are samples to the 10,000s, not the samples to the million. That you're, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Then that other person, I think, and I don't know, I don't have enough data on this, but I don't know how much of this is the algorithm figuring this out or how much of it is just the person, but I've just had pretty good luck with that approach, right? Like the algorithm might go like, oh, a bunch of people that this person follows are now following this account. And so they might surface your content more. They might, I don't know whether what's happening, but it's a pretty effective tool. And I think it's also a good way of looking at, um, yeah, any customer, whether that's someone for sales or that's someone for a, a PR story, you know. That's awesome. It's like, yeah, who are those people looking to who might, who you might, I mean, it's the same thing you do, right? If you're looking for a job and you, and you have a friend at that company, you go talk to that friend yeah. and say, like, could you go talk to them, <laughs> right? Could you put in a good Way word? more effective than going on a jobs portal, let me tell you, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think like that strategy is not new by any means, but. Yeah, that makes sense. Is it, um, did you, did you validate these approaches just through brute force through like trying a bunch of stuff? Some of it didn't yes. work. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> that's curious. Yeah. Um, no, I, I essentially, I mean, now most of, um, most of austere sales are through Instagram on a day to day basis. You know, obviously those articles and bigger publications make a huge difference, but, um, and then you get a lot of traffic from those, but typically like day to day, a lot of the word of mouth and even how those articles found or those publications found us through manufacturing was through Instagram. So, Interesting. um, and I knew nothing about it when I started. And so, yeah, that's been like a year and a half of just trying stuff and kind of seeing what worked and like balancing effort to outcome. But it only took uh, a year balance. and a half to, to get that level of achievement unlocked. As yeah, well. I guess. I mean, I don't that's know how much, cool. of, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I have a super high level of achievement, but, it's no, I mean, working. Dude, you've been in some pretty major publications. You've been killing yeah. it with sales. I mean, yeah, I, I no, think, on I those think you, you cracked it. <laughs> cracking it at least. Yeah, I, I think I think we're a little above four, uh, three thousand followers on Instagram. So it's just you know, it, it's not a super high number. But um, but I I guess the other piece that I sort of thought a lot about is um, like it seems like a lot of these things have compounding effects almost like investing your money right like the more money you can put in sooner the better you are the more money you'll make yeah and so in a similar way i tried to invest a lot more time early and i would still consider myself pretty early but um a lot of time working on even if they're more sort of brute force methods uh, just trying to get more exposure because that exposure breeds exposure, right? So like the yeah, sooner you put sense. in, same with like lean improvements. It's like the sooner you make that improvement that saves you a minute a day, now you get a minute a day in perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's, it's amazing yeah. how the same philosophies that apply to like manufacturing automation apply to marketing, you know, and which also apply to finance. I mean, when you, when you abstract it away at that level. Yeah, it's like if you're trying to get stuff done, there's certain approaches that work. <laughs> I guess. Put in effort early know. and uh, invest <laughs> yeah. in stuff that's going to pay a return. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. You never know. So I guess that's a good segue into... Um, so I, I don't know if it's okay to talk about this, and obviously we can cut it if it isn't, but you, you and I yeah. talk on the phone a lot, and you're mentioning that you have way more orders than you can kind of keep up with right now. Like, is it okay if I say the type of lead times you espouse to me? I, I don't have to bring it up, but. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sneaking into the multiple months. So, yeah. <laughs> which is not so, something we want. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I'd be interested to know, um, what are the things that some of the things you're doing to handle the overflow? Have you considered shopping out production? Have you thought about buying more machines? 
Have you thought about hiring yeah. folks like automation? What, what are you, what are you doing about it? Like, how are you, how are you keeping up um, with the demand? Yeah. I mean, so obviously it's a good problem to have, um, you know, more demand than supply. And it's a constant, been a constant problem as we've improved processes. I think last time we talked, I didn't have any automation on the mill. And so uh, back then to run production of machine parts, I was basically stuck in front of the machine for as long as we were running production. So it's basically these tombstones that would make eight parts. Um, and they were about a 20 minute runtime, but then reload or, you know, 18 minute runtime. And, uh, it would take about five to seven minutes to reload it, which leaves you with like 10 minutes between. Which like, the machine's just sitting there doing nothing. No, no, the, no, sorry. So I had two tombstones. Oh, so I see. while okay. one was running, I'd refill the other. But you were then constantly it would take me about, working. <laughs> it would take me seven minutes to refill it. And then I had 10 minutes of idle time, which I feel like switching tasks and getting anything appreciable completed in 10 minutes is like not happening. Yeah, I agree. Uh, five to get yeah. started, five to wind down. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I just, it was kind of brutal. And like, I just couldn't really get much done. Um, and people needed more stuff. Um, and so at that point, we kind of took a look. This is sort of a different question than you asked, but I'll get back okay. to that. Um, so at that point, we were sort of, you know, it was clear that we had to come up with a way to run more parts, to have the machine run for longer unattended, and ideally not linearly scale the, num the amount of human time it took to uh, you know, re redo the fixture. So you wanted to um, be able just to make sure I'm understanding and tracking. You wanted yeah, to be able to have it run for longer without having to have a person tending it constantly. Yeah, that. But also, like, if I had a massive tombstone that instead of holding eight parts held eighty parts, factor of ten, say my runtime increased by a factor of ten, but then if my reload time increased by a factor of ten, somebody <laughs> would take an operate. You know, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I didn't really want that, but, um, so, so we kind of looked at like, okay, a few options. One, do a much bigger tombstone. So we have a fourth axis on the CNC mill and then we had a little tombstone on it that was essentially cantilevered off the tombstone. Yeah, just for, for lay people out there, by the way, a tombstone is a big chunk of metal that holds a bunch of parts on the outside so you can get them on a CNC machine. Is that? Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't know why it's called tombstone. Well, I guess it sticks up out of the machine. I've seen ones that really closely resemble a tombstone. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. I think on horizontal machines, they really look like tombstones. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. We so, have a form logic that looked just like that. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So those ones look like tombstones. But anyway, so one thought was to sort of go bigger, but we have a vertical machining center. So the tombstone's horizontal. And, and this is also true on a horizontal machine. But the more you cantilever it, the less rigid it gets. Um, and so we were kind of looking at like, well, if we went spend the whole table instead of just this little thing and then put an end support on that. Ooh. Um, but the time invested in designing those tombstones, even an eight part tombstone, it was like five days to sort Jeez. of like, yeah. Cause you're trying to get like two ops on there, right? Like op one, op two, and you have to make sure you have tool clearance for everything. And then the more parts you pack on there, the better. And so you're sort of like trying to pack everything super close, but make sure you can reach it with a tool. And it's like, it's actually quite a bit of work. And then to machine one would take, you know, realistically, it would take a good part of the day to machine it. And you're trying to do it to pretty good tolerances. It makes sense because um, all your parts are reliant on those tolerances. Yeah. And so, and then the other issue that we ran into with these small tombstones that we were kind of worried about with the big tombstones um, is when one pocket from use, you know, you keep making parts in it from overuse, uh, not overuse, but just use, it will wear out for, uh, a certain position. And so one of your parts will start coming in out of spec, right? So you, so you got to retire that position, I'm guessing. Yeah. So then it's like, do we machine a whole new tombstone? that we have a lot of hours in, do we just try to reprogram it to avoid that position? But the way sometimes, you, depending how you program the tool paths, sometimes telling it to not cut on that position is a little harder than other times. 
Anyway, so that became a bit of a headache. I actually talked to a guy who does a lot of the machining for Leatherman and Kershaw and like some other knife companies. Oh, cool. Yeah, I still have a Kershaw knife, I think, in my pocket. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So he does a lot of like consulting for them. And I kind of ran by, ran a few of the options by him. And like he was basically like, yeah, we made these massive fixtures that hold like, you know, 100 or 200 knives. Holy. And God. then they run amazingly and they're hugely productive. And then one position goes out like five thousandths of an inch. Now, trying to comp in one position five thousandths of an inch is pretty difficult because, like, when you say I mean, comp almost, in, you mean like put in an offset to? Yeah. So, okay. like in the machine, you could tell it like instead of cutting here, cut five thousandths to the left. Got it. Okay. But, and this might be a little too in the weeds for this, so maybe I'll just brush over it. But depending how you program the tool pads that is more or less difficult and typically pretty difficult. And, and then like, if it's not actually on all the tools, but you actually just want to comp one tool, <laughs> you know, anyway, it gets very difficult. So you have to go, you just, sorry, yeah. I, I don't mean to no, no. go with the deep thing you said you wanted to skip over, but I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. Do you, have, do you have to go line by line to the G code now in order to do that? Or is there, are there easier ways or is that like a choice? <laughs> Um, it's all a choice. I never line by line edited stuff to a, like to do comp okay. stuff. Um, there's basically not a great way of doing it easily. So, for example, if you edit it line by line, which is often tempting because like you see a really slow linking move where it's like one, it's cutting some material in one place, then the machine retracts and goes over somewhere else, and it does it in like a very slow, annoying way. It's very tempting to go in and hand edit that code. The thing is, those hand edits you need to do every time you make a change to a toolpath and export a new G code. And so if you have like 150 edits on a file, and then you're like, oh, you know, I could save a bunch of time if I just changed my machining approach, which happens. Like people do this all the time. And they have to go make 150 edits again. And then when you go like, oh, you know, I think I could bump the feed the feed on this toolpath by 5% to save a little time, you go like, well, do I really want to do that? Because then I have to hand edit all this stuff. <laughs> and, right? So, like, I try to avoid hand editing code. Um, so then you can... Anyway, it, it's, it's a tricky sense. thing. You can give a specific... You can, like, assign a specific work coordinate system to each pocket. Interesting. But as that number increases and depending on the capabilities of your machine that becomes less viable um or just very complex in which case anyway it, it, so it becomes very very complicated pretty quickly okay. i'm like i think to me when i heard that this is something that big companies are struggling with who have really big budgets and who are producing a lot of parts it's kind of like okay i'm not making up this problem right so like maybe there's a different approach and so we were, what we went with instead is a gripper. Um, so there's sort of two forms of automation in CNC machining, broadly categorized. Um, one would be part loading and the other one would be fixture loading. So one, your automation takes care of putting a new fixture in the machine. And one, your automation takes care of loading a new part into the machine. So just to make sure I'm tracking, changing out a tombstone would be fixture loading. Putting a new yes. blank into the machine would be part loading. Correct. And then if you have an operator loading your parts into that fixture offline, that's great that it's offline, right? Like your spindle is still is still uh, cutting, um, but it's still an operator loading parts. And like after loading those tombstones for a couple of weeks, I was worried about getting tendonitis. And like, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Like my wrist was hurting. Um, I actually sorry, rent. Man. <laughs> the shop um, is in a barn, and the people I rent the barn from, uh, they're both physical therapists. <laughs> <laughs> so I it's actually brought park. one of them in. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hey, like, can you just like watch me work and tell me, you know, what you see that's wrong here? Um, so just like a little ergonomics thing. But, you know, it's just a, it's sort of a bummer. So I was very interested in, in figuring out automation that was part-loading automation which is much trickier. Um, 
in general because like your fixtures can have very robust interfaces to the machine and like very repeatable like a zero point system but then like with stock every batch of stock you get is going to be a little bit different does it have chips on it how do you deal with chips on your vice when you open and close the vice all this other stuff and like how much of this is sort of open loop controls how much feedback do you actually need to make sure you don't crash the machine in a major way yeah uh is there room for fixture loading and a part loading operation because it would seem that there still is like i, I feel like i saw i've seen f operations that load individual parts but also utilize a zero point system in some way to change out fixtures and how they handle those parts yeah i think so i mean something like i've thought about like we have all our all our automation is on zero point systems Cool. So if I want to switch from... By the way, zero-point system, we should probably define for people listening that haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. So zero-point system is just um, if you want to be able to quickly remove something from your machine. It's like a vice, From a CNC instance. machine, like a vice or a fixture that's holding your machine parts. And then uh, on a typical machine, if you put a vice on the machine, you have to spend like 5 to 15 minutes getting it aligned with the machine and getting it back to a, posi a known position. Um, I'm assuming that's just touching off a probe and like making sure it's in the right place and then setting off. Yeah, and like sweeping the jaws and making sure they're aligned with the your axes. Um, Sounds and, expensive. Uh, yeah, it's just time consuming and annoying. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go like, well, I would run this other thing, but I don't want to break down my setup. Yeah. So with a zero point system, it allows you to very quickly remove stuff and then put it back and it will repeat to a zero point. Um, every time and different systems have different repeatability what's a zero point in this context just to like the same data like the okay, same cool. point. and so yeah, what that so looks like and the way i've always seen it is like like a shunk or some other kind of like nipples that get sucked into the machine and then they're tapered so i think that's what creates the accuracy but correct me where i'm wrong here yeah uh well actually i mean sort of interesting so lang and shunk are both both manufacture a zero point system they're both german companies there's many other companies who do it, um, but those I would say broadly are the two system like system approaches. Um, there, there's a couple others, but um, the interesting thing is Lang. Uh, I think that their quoted re uh, repeatability is plus or minus five ten thousandths of an inch. Okay. And I asked the sales guy, you know, at what point would you suggest someone go get a chunk because these are just not repeatable enough. Chunk is a lot more expensive. Um, yeah. And he was like, well, if they told me they needed, my, you know, plus or minus three ten thousandths of an inch or less, you'd have to go with a chunk system. Um, nice. And I always want to work with that sales guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I We've talked about that before. Anyway. Sales folks will actually give you the straight up, like, here's where everything is good. Here's where it starts to not work. If you're in this region, I suggest you buy it. If not, um, yeah. But uh, basically, it comes down to Lang uses essentially elastic averaging to achieve a set position. Oh. And so all these studs or nipples um, go into a hole. Like there's four of them, and they each go into a hole. And then there's pins that engage them to pull the whole thing down. Yeah. And so you're essentially relying on fairly well machined components, and then every time it clamps, it's loading that system the same. But yeah. So elastic you, averaging is like the bending of those of those yeah. uh, sticking out parts being. Because there's no way you're going to get it so precise that they go in and it's the same every time, um, just because there's variability in machining. Whereas the shunk system is minimally over constrained. So the issue with the line system is it's, it's very over constrained. Yeah. Um, and so the shunk system is minimally over constrained in that there's, two, there's a face to face contact, full contact. So that's over constrained. But the nice thing about planes is it's very easy. It's not very easy. It is a very known science how to produce a very flat surface. Right. So getting full face to face contact is really nice for rigidity because you get super high rigidity but also making two flat planes that come together is fairly straightforward in terms of manufacturing. What, um, what's, can I, can we take a step back and yeah. like talk about what that science looks like or is it just um, facing off yeah. the planes or? 
Well, I mean, I'm happy to get into it. It's sort of a rabbit hole. Uh, it's a rabbit <laughs> hole that was like a three-year chapter of, of, of my reading, like, <laughs> um, which is basically high precision. And uh, if you've ever asked yourself the question, like, how do you make a very precise tool before you have a precise tool, right? Like typically you rely on precise tools for making um, parts that are typically one tenth the precision of that tool, right? Like rule of thumb is if you want a tolerance of plus or minus five, five thousandths of an inch, you should have a machine that holds a tolerance of plus or minus five tenths. Yeah, makes sense. Right, or is, or is produced to that. Same with measuring. If you want to measure with an act, you know, and you want to be certain about down to three decimals, you should have something that has four decimals. Okay. Because otherwise you have sort of 10% variability on that last digit. It makes sense. Anyway, so how did I get into that? Um, I asked <laughs> so you a tangential question. <laughs> trying to walk it back to precision. Um, yeah. So it turns out. Okay, so right, so like, if how how was the first square made, right? Like a framing square, well, not a framing square, a machinist square. Yeah, that's meant to be super, super, super square. How do you make the first one, right? Or like, question. how do you make a mill that is precise to plus or minus five tenths or less, fifty millionths, plus or minus fifty millionths of an inch? without having a machine that is 10 times more accurate. And if that, and if you need a machine that's 10 times more accurate, where did that machine come from? <laughs> and where did it's the machine that made that one come from, right? <laughs> so like at some point you need to have a way of achieving precision from imprecise tools. And the foundation of all mechanical accuracy comes back to the flat plane. So, um, you can create a flat plane without having a flat plane, which is kind of interesting. That's and the really way to do it is called a three plate method. Um, so you take three plates and then you get them close to flat and then you rub A to B, B to C and A to C. So A, B and C are the centers of the plates? Sorry, A, B and C are the plates. So you have three plates, okay. A, B and C. Oh, so you and rub them against each other. To you rub them out. against okay, each got other. It. Got it with ink on it or you know a marking die and then you can see where they touch and then Ooh. you can sand off the areas and then you can keep doing that so because the, the areas with, where the die gets ablated or rubbed off is the areas they touch okay and yeah that makes sense and so you can keep doing that and through like if you continue to do that uh you will achieve a flat plane and the reason it's three plates and not two plates is you can have a perfectly matched two plates and you ah. do rubbings at 90 degrees to each other right so you do a bit like this and a bit like this you can get perfectly matched two plates that you think are flat but actually they're spherical right so like one yep. is convex and one guy's concave but if you have a b and c if you have then you'd end up with two convex plates and it when would, you rub them you see that yeah, that's yeah, and awesome. so that's why it's three plates. Anyway, it's so, so clever. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> very it's clever. Incredible. And then the way you get a 90 degree angle is a whole procedure. It's very interesting. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, you should read the book um, Fundamentals of Mechanical Accuracy by the Moore Special Tool Company. It's a very awesome book. I highly recommend it. Um, Fundamentals of Mechanical Accuracy. Thank you. Anyway, so Shunk has a face to face engagement, which is great for. Um, it, it, it's very good for rigidity. Uh, it is over constrained. So three points make a plane indicating that you should have only three points of contact. But if you have two, if you have three true point contacts, they're very low rigidity, right? Any, any pressure you'd end up denting your right the other side. Um, when and you say and the so, other side, just to, well, if you have like three pointy points yeah, sitting on a metal plate, and that is, that is uh, perfectly, that's minimally constrained, right? It's, uh, it's kinematically constrained to a plane. Yeah, there's, Three points. It's, it's as constrained as it needs to be to hold position and no more than that. To hold, yeah. So that eliminates three, three degrees of, uh, three, um, three degrees of freedom. And there's six on a body. Anyway, so it can still slide in X, Y, and it can rotate about Z. It makes sense. Uh, with two points of contact. If you have point contacts and someone comes along and hits that with a hammer, 
where those points are touching that plate, they'll just dent into the plate, right? So it's pretty low rigidity. It makes sense. So it can't take high forces. So that's the issue with like kinematically constrained objects is you often trade off rigidity. So you have to carefully consider how you're doing that. And so what you see in machining is even kinematically mounted things tend to be a planar contact, which is, which is over constraint. Anyway, deep in the weeds here. Shunk uses Massive a face-to-face -face contact, um, which is nice for rigidity. Yeah. And then they use a taper, which eliminates an XY movement. And then their second pin, that taper is actually ground away such that only two points, two side-to-side -side points are touching. And so it's minimally over constraints. So you have that you have a face contact with and then you have one tapered pin. Yeah. And so between the so two, you that can eliminates pivot, you're up against right. it, and that's your only degree of freedom. And then exactly. you add another one where you could do this hypothetically, but you can't do the side to side. Exactly. Okay. And because of that, it's minimally over constrained. And so that's why it repeats to minus to to a uh, a better degree of accuracy than in the Lang system. Because every time you put the Lang system together, Boom. as you load it, it's going to plastically, it's, it's going to elastically deform rather uh, slightly different every yeah, time. Because it's plastically okay. deforming? No, no, it's elastic deformation, okay. but depending on friction and what ends up engaging slightly first and sticking Probably or not weight sticking. Also, like if it's loaded and can't deliver it out. And stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All of that is going to have an effect. Whereas a minimally over constrained system, again, is going to go to, back to plus or minus a uh, few tenths in this case. Um, if you had a true kinematic mount, that would repeat to a few millionths, even if all the components in that kinematic mount were super low precision components. That's interesting. Which is pretty awesome. When you say a kinematic mount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so more in the weeds. Um, <laughs> Kinematic mounting, basically, a physical body has six degrees of freedom. Yep. So um, up, three down. Three translational and three rotate. Okay, yep, makes yeah. sense. So X, yeah, Y, Z, so roll pitch, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so kinematic mounting, it turns out that with six, that each point of contact takes away one degree of freedom if they're arranged properly. So if you have a cube and you set that on three point contacts, you've eliminated three degrees of freedom. It can't move. Oh, this is assuming a seating force. So gravity in this case. Yeah. So if a cube is sitting on three points of contact, it can't move up and down because of gravity. Or sorry, I should say it won't move up and down, right? Yeah. Just sitting there. It sits on three points. Can't move up and down. Um, can't roll about X and can't roll about Y. So it eliminated one translational degree of freedom and two rotational. Yeah. And then if you put a point contact on the side of that cube, as well as those three, suddenly it, you've eliminated another linear motion, right? So now it can't move side to side in X and it can't move up and down in Z and it can't rotate about X or Y. Yeah. You had two on the right side of the block you've eliminated a rotational degree of freedom. And then if you add one last one on the far side of the block, now it can't move in X, Y, or Z, and it can't rotate about any one of those. I'm axes a little bit either. lost at this point, I'm being honest. Okay, but if there's, yeah, anyway, if there, if there's look a up, video that shows this or something we can splice in, that might help. Yeah, or if you look up kinematic mounting, but it's kinematic used a lot mounting, in the okay. semiconductor industry. Um, so when you want to load a new silicon wafer into a into a lithography machine, that wafer is some of, that's the flattest surface, um, not quite, but it's near the flattest surface humans can produce are those silicon wafers. Cool. And that's so that the light that is used in that process, which isn't visible in the visible spectrum, but that light is in focus everywhere on that wafer so that you can make a ton of my, of, uh, microchips at once of semiconductors, right? Um, and, and so the, 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 I forget what they call it. Anyway, the thing that holds those silicon wafers when you put it into the machine has to repeat to a few millionths of an inch. Wow. And the only way to do that without spending, you know, billions of dollars and then thermally controlling your environment to an absurd, unrealistic degree <laughs> so that 
thermal deformation don't, doesn't affect it is a kinematic mount because as parts grow and uh, with, with heat differentials, um, that kinematic mount is going to behave the same. That's cool. Oh, I actually, damn, I actually have two kinematic mount examples, but they're in the other building. Brutal. Um, I made two because one is designed and it is theoretically a kinematic mount, but it has very low um, stiffness. Makes sense. So it's instant, what is that? It's instant centers converge, essentially. So anyway, it has twist, whereas the other one is like designed in a way that it's properly kinematic and it's rigid. Or it's not it's not rigid. It is, uh, well, it's sort of rigid. Anyway. <laughs> It'd be interesting um, to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab them at some point. But um, anyway, so that, that's the zero point system. Um, and how did we get here? We were talking about automation. So you were talking yes. about part loading versus fixture loading. Yes, and you asked, is there room for both? Yes. The answer is yes. With a zero point system, if I have different automation systems to produce different components, it is very convenient to be able to switch between them. Right now, that's a manual process for me, but there's a lot of very fancy factories where when they switch from one component to the other, you need to switch your vice jaws. Now, do I need an operator to go in and switch those vice jaws, or is that something the robot can, a robot can take care of? And so that would be an example of, I have automation for my fixtures, and then I also have automation for my part loading. Nice. And that is not, uh, yeah, it's done. Like, people do that. Um, I would feel like the easiest way to do that would be to have a bunch of vices, but that would also get very expensive. That is a way of doing it, um, for sure, and people do that as well. Uh, but in, like, really high, large-scale production, you know, the inertia of those vices, moving them around, is less efficient than not moving I see. them around. You can have lower table accelerations on your CNC. Um also, that say I have you know 500 parts I want to produce on one machine, I could either get an enormous machine <laughs> or I could figure out how to switch them out. The other thing yeah. is like if I'm doing part loading and I switch what st my stock size, I might need to change the end effector on the robot. Yeah, and so that would be another example of fixturing essentially. Yeah, the end effector is a fixture more or less. Right. Um, yeah. So. Anyway, long story short, we, we went with single piece automation uh, part loading. So we have a gripper in our tool changer, actually. If you didn't realize you could do, you can stick a gripper in the tool changer and use through spindle air to actuate the gripper. And then it basically goes and picks up a part and then moves it to a pneumatic vice. Um, really yeah, it's, it's, cool. it's, it's, it's kind of nice. And I would say the nicest thing about it is that um, you already own a big fancy robot, and that is the CNC mill, right? And, and so for us, looking at the idea of buying a whatever $50,000 robotic arm was a little bit daunting financially, um, especially given that there was still uncertainty in terms of implementation. So Makes sense. I've never gotten a robotic arm to talk to a CNC mill. I know it's doable. I suspect if you've done it before, it is not complicated. <laughs> I have not done it before, and so contemplating sort of biting off that big project all at once and figuring out um, part loading, um, it, it just felt like a really, really big step. And given that, it was kind of hard to pull the trigger on such an expensive thing. So instead, oh, and the other big piece is if you get a robotic arm to automate a milling machine, you still need to put end effectors. And it turns out that the gripper we put in our tool changer is literally the same gripper people put on the end of robots. That's where it's typically used. Nice. So you're already investing money in an end effector if you do eventually want to graduate to a, a, a you know a robot, and you need a pneumatic vice if you get a robot. So like all the money we spent to set up our system is money you would have to spend anyway. Um, and parts you could repurpose onto the robot if you went that route. Exactly. Yeah, and, and there are reasons you'd want a robot instead of the part instead of the system we're doing. Um, we have the advantage of making very small parts, and so if you were doing much bigger parts, I don't think this would be a super viable approach. But um, anyway, so we went with that approach, and the interesting part is we basically put a, a gripper in the tool changer, which grabs a new block of aluminum, puts it into a vise, the machine machines it, the gripper goes in and unloads it, 
and then goes and gets another one and it keeps running. And, and we've gotten up, up to about two hour run times. But the best part is it takes us about three minutes between runs to get it running again. So that's three minutes of human time and then and two, two hours. hours. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so that part's been really transformative uh, just for the business because in that time we can go do other things. Um, and then the other thing that's been really interesting about it, and anyone who does automation will kind of tell you this, Every and going in, I kind of didn't believe it, but now I'm like, oh, they were totally right, is people always say, like, don't worry about your cycle time when you're doing automation. And it's like, yeah, sure, that's nice to say, but, like, I would rather have a short cycle time. But it turns out that, like, a reliable process running 24-7 a day, 24-7, you know, 24-7 a day. Lights out, yeah, ideally. <laughs> 24-7 I guess that would be a week. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> yeah. So that's going to be much more productive than something that runs twice as fast, but messes up every now and then. Then you have to stop and you have to remake your, your soft jaws on your vice because it squished the part in them and dented the soft jaws, all stuff we've done. Um, and uh, anyway, so, so that's, that's very interesting. It's like process reliability is huge. And we've been so much more productive in terms of parts produced per day, even though our cycle time is slower. Interesting. Because it just turns out we can run, like I'm over there in the shop all day, every day, basically. Anytime the CNC stops, I stop what I'm doing. I go over, I spend three minutes to get it to run again. And then I go back to what I was doing. Whereas before it was like, well, I can't really realistically I couldn't do that, right? I couldn't stop every 10 minutes, spend seven to 10 minutes reloading a thing, put it in, and then I have another 10 minutes. Like, I just didn't you can't get anything, get anything done. done. Yeah. Yeah. So that, okay, so that goes back to the idea of like scaling. So if you wanted to get more machines, I feel like that the tech you've developed and the, the knowledge yeah. and the processes, I mean, you could have 10 machines doing that and have one person running them and, and be fine, I would think, if you staggered the, the start. Yeah. Rate. Yeah, for sure. And so I think a couple of very interesting things that I don't actually have the answer to, and I'd be curious if anyone who's listening um, has any thoughts on is... What's a good way to get a hold of you if somebody wants to weigh in? Oh, good question. Um, on Instagram, um, we are austere underscore manufacturing. Um, you can catch me on LinkedIn. I think I'm just Uriel Eisen. Uh, yeah, that, those are probably the best ways to get to hold me. Um, but basically, we could go with a robotic arm on a CNC mill, but now our total machine to produce that part is like 150k. And because so, 100 for the mill and then 50 for the arm. Yeah, just rough numbers. Yeah, right? got it. Now, if I could produce the same part on a system that only cost 110000 for just a mill with like $10,000 of automation, that just seems like in the long run, absolutely more efficient, capital-wise, right? Yeah, I mean, $40,000 per <laughs> right, setup is a decent right. amount of money. And so I don't quite know how to think about this because 35%. like there's a machine called a woman, which is essentially a bar-fed lathe with a five axis milling head in it. And then a vice that flips up to grab a part from the lathe spindle flips down. So it's basically a bar fed mill. Yeah. For my parts, it would be perfect. It would be amazing. Like my automation, I could run, you know, probably for like three or four or five days straight. The issue is that they're $800,000. Ah. Brutal. So that's <laughs> yeah. like if you wanted to buy like a DMG Mori, like. Yeah, um, like that's just a very super expensive deluxe. machine. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so my question is like, if I can get the same job done on a hundred thousand dollar machine, why am I spending eight hundred thousand dollars? Even if it can do it a little better, I don't know how that math works out. Because right, obviously there's a point. Like if I told you it's eight times faster, then it's like okay, well that math works. Yeah. Right. Or if you're like non-recurring engineering is a lot less on that other machine you could figure out what the how many parts you'd have to put into production for that payoff or for that that makes sense you know, saving anyway so i don't quite know how to think about that but yeah as you said like the mill with the gripper we have in there right now 
like as there's more demand, that's something you can just copy and paste, essentially. Super given cool. the funds. If you want to give us funds, that's another reason to reach out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so, so that, that's kind of, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of my thinking. Um, one, I mentioned our runtime is about two hours on one of those. Yeah. Um, so something we're working on currently is a flip station to flip apart from op one top two. So op one is when you machine the top of it. Op two is when you machine the bottom of that same aluminum blank. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and currently uh, we need to manually flip it, and then the, the gripper kind of loads it back into place. Um, so our pallets of parts are half blocks of aluminum and half half machined parts. Anyway, so add a flip station, and then add a lot more stock in the machine, and then and then that should be able to get us up to like eight to 16 hour run times. Nice. And the, the thing about that, in terms of increasing our throughput, um, is uh, being able to run overnight. So right now we're not running 16 overnight. 16 seems like the holy grail for that. I mean, if you could. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Where you come in and it's still running and you go like, yes. Yeah. Money, money, money. <laughs> money. Yeah. yeah so cool. I, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's our next big step is to get proper overnight runs. In that, there's a lot of process reliability stuff that we're not doing currently. Like, it'd be great to measure every tenth part or every fifth part and make sure that some critical dimensions are not drifting outside of some tolerance. Yeah, uh, and because, just shut it down if it is and, you know, yeah. flag for operator inspection, maybe send a text. Right. And so, like, running overnight is great until you come in in the morning and it turns out you turned, you know... <laughs> Eight hundred or a thousand dollars of stock <laughs> into trash. <laughs> so Hilarious. it's hugely productive, even if you're making scrap. Um, yeah. So that, those are some of the things we want to work out. Tool life management is another one. You know, right now, if something starts sounding awful, or like between batches, we do like a ten percent QC on our parts, just to make sure. Like again, like. You know, it runs for two hours, so it's making a good number of parts. Like, it's making 40 parts at a time, and it's a shame to make 40 garbage parts. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it's, it's a waste of material, and it's a waste of machine time. Um, and, and so we do sort of inspection and make sure our surface finishes are good and everything's looking great. Um, if we're running 16 hours, you know, day after day, uh, overnight, there's a chance that one of our tools is wearing, and it... it becomes an issue at hour two, right, of some 16-hour run. And so we're producing six hours of really not, no, producing 14 Brutal. hours of bad parts. Yeah, so I guess the way you would get ahead of that is you would have some kind of automated inspection, and then you might have extra tools in your tool holder that are just meant to be replacements. When you So you have a tool go bad, it pops, yeah. it wears, whatever. You swap it into an empty slot, and you grab another one, and then you're, you're back up and running. I yeah, think. and so... I, no, I mean, it's called, yeah, sister tooling is uh, um, kind of the answer there. But in order to use that effectively, we either need to be able to do really good inspection of our tools or like like inspecting for surface finish on your part is kind of tricky in process. Um, or just do a crude kind of uh, just tool life monitoring based on hours cutting. Right, and so over time, you have like historical data about how how many hours can this eighth inch end mill cut before we should really switch it out. Yeah, makes and sense. Say it goes bad at hour. I'm making up this number, but say it goes bad after a hundred hours of cutting. Uh, you know, maybe you just back that off to like a ninety-five. You just call it a day. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, but that that's a lot of systems, you know, to 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 put into place and. So, I mean, it's, that's it sounds like you got a roadmap, though. I mean, that's that's awesome. Got a roadmap, and then yeah, once we're running overnight, um, and then we'll probably go ahead and add a second, team and, you know, maybe a third, fourth, and fifth. Um, nice. Depending, I think so. <laughs> Badass. That's super duper cool. So I feel like, like I don't know. There's a lot more stuff I want to ask you. Um, we could go one of two ways. We could cut it here. And then record another one and kind of get more in the weeds. Um, um, either way, or we, we can keep going for a bit. Yeah. Uh, probably have 
a few more minutes here. Cool. Or if you want to cut it, we can cut it. Well, maybe like we, we talk a little more, but like not too much. I've been trying to kind of keep it like close to an hour just to yeah, experiment yeah, with that. Fine. You're Usually fine. I let these run like three hours and then nobody listens. To the last <laughs> so I feel like if, if we, if we make this one short, just to see how it does, it'll be interesting to check the analytics and then absolutely just, yep. you know, just the, for the stuff you were talking about early on. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. Make what people want to hear. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, what else do you have in the pipe? Like what, what are some of the things coming up for, for you and a steer? Things to look out for, um, new colors, new improvements, people you're trying to bring on board. Um, I don't yeah. Know. Well, we are Coming hiring. Products. So if anyone knows anyone in the Kitsap uh, Peninsula area that uh, wants an interesting job at a lean company, um, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call us a lean company. Uh, a lean aspirations. <laughs> um, <laughs> we spend time every day improving processes. So... Um, I think it, it's a more interesting work environment um, to be able to, to kind of do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, scaling is a big one. We are launching new colors every now and then. Um, definitely check us out on Instagram, austere underscore manufacturing. Um, you can kind of see some of the process stuff. Uh, that flip station is going to be big for us. Um, so pushing pretty hard on that. Trying to automate, which is something we've talked about, trying to automate paint interesting um, yeah very cool yeah so well, that's a tricky one um it's something i keep thinking about every time we run paint i'm like man we really need to automate this um but it has a lot of variables so like temperature and humidity seem to affect viscosity to some extent makes sense and then you have a few valves and then that you can adjust like how much paint flows how much air flows what size area is it sprayed into which affects essentially like you know particles per whatever like how much paint is hitting the surface in any given spot yeah and you'd almost need a robot to do that i would think like that's that's sort of the point where you have to invest in that i could be wrong potentially but. yeah uh i yeah i think they're like i sort of designed a stupid system for doing it that would be like pneumatic um, in terms of like you because there's this is done commercially on small parts it's uh, like a spin painting line Ooh. where all the parts are spun and then there's just nozzles that hit it from different angles That's and cool. you sort of just like tweak it. Yeah, it's cool. You tweak it till it's like painting good parts. I think the struggle you for use me... You Cerakote though, which is not that forgiving. I mean, like I would think... Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's that aspect. Also, we run a few different SKUs and so like I'm not going to leave a line set up and because we're sort of trying to do just in time and sort of small batch sizes, like one of those lines, I feel like lends itself to getting something set up and tweaking all the angles and how much time and how much paint is coming out of each nozzle. And I just feel like by the time you set that up, you want to run a few thousand parts through it before you break it down and like set it something <laughs> else up. Um, so anyway, so I think some sort of automation, like something you can program and then save that program and come back to it, I think is probably the answer. You might Whether be able to do like that a, with a spin paint line, the way you're describing it. Like, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I mean, you could record kind of position and valve positions yep. and so on. Um, yeah, Time's so but there might, there might be a hybrid. Like what I'm sort of thinking is if you have a rotary axis that the part is on, and then you have your the angles the gun needs to hit it from it might be possible to program one gun to hit those different positions while the thing spins and then be able to code in a duration at each position oh cool or something like that right so like that might be some hybrid where you're not spending whatever 20 to 50 grand or 100 i got a quote on a painting robot that's like with software and everything kind of ready to paint for a hundred thousand so i sort of like yeah oh, mm, i don't know I just buy a second cnc machine <laughs> yeah exactly uh so but I, it's kind of an interesting puzzle um yeah i think it's you know it's 100 percent solvable like tons of companies are automating yeah yeah and, i mean um, i've seen it in real life a bunch of times yeah yeah but so I mean, sure expensive <laughs> is all <laughs> No that's the thing it. so that, that you know we're kind of looking at that um apparently there's this I, i'm getting the name off the top of my head there's a sort of a stepper motor uh servo ish company i mean it's servo for sure but um that has 
it's sort of like plug and play and then it all runs on decode which i thought was very interesting Wait, just like a gantry system i'm, I'm picturing but maybe I'm no wondering. they're literally motors like you buy motors and you command them with g-code and they're all sort of configured so it's not like okay so I mean, it's just a degree of, of freedom wherever you want it rotary and then yeah and then you assign it presumably an axis and you can probably configure that to something you know that's the appropriate yeah i thought that was kind of cool because like for me i know g-code and the other thing is like i think g-code though it's a ridiculous language um from a readability perspective <laughs> uh it is nice like compared to like a a plc like a plc from what i've seen doesn't have a great way oh, there i mean there's tons of very robust ways of doing this but like sequenced events it seems a little oh, bit interesting the way you have to do it you have to like I, map a bunch of like step one step two step three things that get enabled i don't love it i um i think i told you I, i've done like robot path planning in plcs okay. and that was oh, just a little bit of a stupid use of plcs like i felt like an idiot you know i was like why are we doing it this way come on like the... yeah right they're like <laughs> super robust obviously but I, I mean, you're, you're trying to go, like, between a bunch of waypoints, so you've got to do, like, you've got to figure out how to drive the robot between those, which is one step. You've got to find the next waypoint and queue that up, which is another step. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of, I mean, it's been years since I programmed this, but it was all graphics-based, and it took forever, and it would have been huh. way easier to do it in C. And so I'm sure it's right. a similar thing, where if you've got a textual language you know, like G-Code. Well, G-Code is even simpler than C for sequence stuff in that instead of like, I don't know exactly the best way of sequencing stuff in a C program, but like G code just executes one code, line of code after the next. Yeah, I mean, Not, C does that too, I mean, as far as I know. C does that too, but it's a, like a very fast refresh rate, right? So that's not really how it's done typically. My understanding, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't do this on the program. You mean, how does it get compiled? Oh yeah. I'm it's been a while since I got my computer science degree. I, I don't want to go too far off. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I don't, this is really not my field of expertise at all. So all of what I just said is, you know, likely not correct or, um, Grain of salt is what we're trying to say here, guys. <laughs> very good solutions that I'm unaware of, but I am familiar with G-Code. Um, and so that is tempting. Um, nice. To this program that's in G-Code. Uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think like scaling, um, QC, hiring, uh, and more automation stuff um, are, are the big, the big things I'm kind of, kind of thinking about. Um, and yeah, how to kind of, um, how how much capital to invest, how to invest a certain amount of capital to move a project forward, as uh, like to scale things fast. Um, is a puzzle for Sora. Um, and then, yeah, all of that kind of reading a lot of lean books at the same time. Shiji Shingo is the man. In oh, morning. dude. Um, yeah, that guy is awesome. Yeah, so I'm currently reading. that you recommended, one of the best yeah, books. Yeah, that's an awesome one. And that was sort of his big contribution. But then I just really like the way he writes about it, about all this stuff. So I'm reading one right now that is the title, but it's basically... Um, a study, I think it's called a study of the Toyota production system. Um, so, you know, um, Ono wrote the Toyota production system, and this is kind of digging into that book a bit more. And I thought that was very interesting. I just read a chapter last night in which, and this is a very interesting uh, kind of something I hadn't thought about before in this way, but as you reduce, reduce batch sizes, your inventory and your Kanban trigger points are greatly reduced because, and this is super makes sense. Basically, you want to set your Kanban trigger point for like a Kanban card is just like a card that triggers a reorder. It doesn't need to be a physical card, but like if you have a bunch of, I don't know, uh, buckle parts and then yeah. you want to make sure that you don't run out, at some point you want to say, hey, we need to make more of this type. And I think we have and a so, clip where you and I are talking about Kanban cards. Maybe we can put oh, cool. yeah. in the description. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and, and so, like, where that is triggered is based on how long it will take you to make a new back and deliver it, right? 
to make sure you never run out. So say you use 10 a day and it takes you 10 days to manufacture more, you'd want to give yourself at 100, you'd want to trigger a reorder, but more likely you'd want to leave a buffer yep. as well. It's like a buck 20 It'd probably be like 120, triggers a reorder. Now, if you reduce your batch size from 100 to 50, your lead time might drop in half, right? You might cut your lead time in half, maybe not quite in half, but if it's reduced, not only do you reduce um, your lead time, so now instead of needing to have 120, maybe you drop that down to, you know, 80. But now when we drop another 50 on that same, in that same storage area, now we're only up to 130, right? Whereas before we dropped an, another 100 on top of 120 is what oh, our storage so area needs to accommodate. Yeah. And so you can very quickly make yourself need a warehouse to keep your stuff, <laughs> and that's very expensive. And so it's just very interesting. That's really cool, say. though, because I feel like every time I hear about the photo production system, I hear that, like, you're supposed to not have a whole lot of inventory on hand or, like, yeah. you're supposed to, you know, run, you know, as close to single piece flow as you can get. But I don't hear why. And so that's that's what's interesting about this guy, uh, Shingo. Shingo. Yeah. Am I saying his name right? Shijio Shingo. I Shijio think. Shingo. Yeah, I think that's what you said. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that, that was quite interesting. And there's a lot of other stuff that's just like a little counterintuitive. Um, for example, oh, this was super cool. And then maybe we can call it because I, uh, I think you probably need to jump off. But um, no worries. Yeah, I'm probably going to be late uh, finding our plans, but it's all good. <laughs> basically, they showed, he showed a case study, two case studies. And these were both things I think if I had done my own analysis, I would have come to the opposite conclusion and it would have been the wrong conclusion. Interesting. Um, so this is why it's kind of stuck in my head. If you have three machines um, and you have if you have a part that needs three ops that happens on three machines, it doesn't have to be one piece. Say you have three machines and they each run a part, right? Part one makes a hundred in an hour. So machine will run one is making a hundred parts an hour, machine two is making say eighty an hour, and machine three is making fifty an hour. Um, and all those get These assembled are into a operations. deliverable. Okay. Or say it's three operations. It's tempting to keep your machines at 100% uptime, right? So you have a person at each just cranking through parts. It turns out if you have one person, firstly, it's about five times more expensive to have a person waiting than a machine waiting, typically. Interesting. And so what he did is he did one person between those three machines and just changes out part a part on machine one, changes out a part on machine two, then goes and changes out a part on machine one, uh, three and keeps doing that. Machine one is going to be idle part of the time. Yep. But you just eliminated you just eliminated two people off that production line, and your total um, your total output per machine drops, but your total output per person is much higher. Interesting. So I just thought that was interesting because if I was owning an expensive machine, I would be very tempted to maximize to be analyzing for parts produced per machine per hour. You said a person parts. costs five times more than a machine? That's the way he said okay. in the book. And that's old info and um, I suspect it's still about right. <laughs> but if you if you finance I mean maybe it's a little wrong, but Probably if you finance on the machine and the person, but yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah, like a hundred K machine a machine if you financed it would be like two K a month. Like I don't know what employer you're hiring, but two K a month is you know pretty, pretty less than they cost. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, that'd be what like twenty four grand a year. Yeah, yeah, nobody. I could keep talking about that stuff forever, but maybe we'll uh, jump on another time at some point. Cool. Well, this has been really fun. I, I think I got some math wrong, so uh, we'll fix that in editing, Carl. <laughs> fix it in post. Yeah. <laughs> Just put a note. Be like, this. This is not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, cause I'm really putting a lot of onus on the editor here to figure out my mathematical error. <laughs> I don't I don't know what it was. So. I can't remember what it was either. I'll, I'll go back through and listen. But yeah, um, anywho, this has been fun. Um, I really appreciate having you on. Um, if you're in Kingston, Washington or around it, um, you can correct me on the name of the area, but check no, out Astere Manufacturing. Cool place to work. Um, just small operation, room for growth, interesting process improvements going on there. Um, check it out. Uh, I'll vouch for this yeah. guy. He's awesome. 
<laughs> Thanks and, for uh, having me on. Thanks Always for coming fun. on. <laughs> yeah, appreciate right. you, man. All right. I uh, will I'm have gonna... you soon.